I honestly didn't think I would be as interested in the history of today's topic when I first started reading about it. There was a lot of chemistry involved, and anyone who knew me in high school knows that that's the worst subject for me. When you listen to the episode, you'll notice I kept the chemistry aspect to a minimum. But as I kept researching, what intrigued me the most was when the chemistry switched to biology and women's studies toward the end, when working conditions for those making today's subject resulted in a serious epidemic and women went on strike to protect themselves and other workers. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind Matches. But first, a quick book update. One month! That's how long until the Story Behind book is released. If you're in the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook, you may have seen that my publisher changed the cover. You may have also noticed in your podcast app that the podcast cover art has changed to go along with that cover. If you've pre-ordered your copy already, go ahead and send a screenshot of the receipt or confirmation email to the Story Behind pod at gmail.com to be entered in a giveaway for some swag. And just to let you know, there are currently book giveaways over on the Epic Film Guys podcast, and there will be another giveaway next month with the Podcast Brunch Club. Check out both of these for a chance to win a copy, and I'm sure I'll have some more ways for you to get your hands on a book later on. And thank you to everyone who has already pre-ordered the book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You guys are the best! The match might seem like a fairly recent invention, maybe only a few hundred years old. But believe it or not, historians trace the first match-like way of starting fire all the way back to the first century AD in China. This was around the time the book Records of the Unworldly and the Strange was written by Tao Gu. He described sticks made of pine combined with sulfur igniting as soon as they were touched to fire. At the time, they were called fire inch stick. Many scholars believe it was women of the Northern Qi Dynasty in 577 AD who invented these fire inch sticks when they were unable to search for timber because their city was under siege at the time. But most people through the centuries started fires by striking flint against steel. In fact, even after the accidental discovery of phosphorus in the 1600s, which is the main ingredient used in making matches, flint and steel was still the popular method up to the 19th century. Hennig Brandt of Hamburg, Germany, was one of the many alchemists over the centuries attempting to turn metals into gold. In his experimenting in 1669, he accidentally produced the element phosphorus. One of the main ingredients in phosphorus is actually urine, since it contains dissolved phosphates. Using bodily fluids was actually pretty common among alchemists, if you remember back to the story behind gunpowder in which manure was used to create saltpeter. Alchemists were not only searching for a way to produce gold, but also to produce a way to grant eternal life, or, British version of the Harry Potter book aside, produce the Philosopher's Stone, which was what a few alchemists began using phosphorus for, since it came from the body. The name phosphorus, by the way, comes from the Greek word phosphoros, meaning bringer of light. Brand became the first named person to have discovered an element. Phosphorus is vital for living organisms, and depending on the kind of phosphorus, there are different ways of igniting it. For example, red phosphorus needs friction to light on fire and is used in more modern matches, while white phosphorus, also known as yellow phosphorus, catches fire more spontaneously. Remember these distinctions because they'll come up again later. Less than two decades later, British physicist Sir Robert Boyle coated paper in phosphorus and a splinter of wood in sulfur. When the sulfur-dipped stick was dragged across the paper, it ignited. But because of the inability to get an abundant amount of phosphorus, this was just considered a novelty. In the early 1800, French chemists created the ethereal match, which was paper covered in phosphorus that would ignite when exposed to air. They sealed this paper in a glass bottle called the match, and when the bottle was smashed, the paper would ignite. Another variation was a splinter of wood dipped in a mixture of potassium chlorate, sugar, and gum arabic that when dipped in a bottle of sulfuric acid would ignite. There was also the Promethean, which was a piece of wood with a glass bead at the end. When the glass bead was broken, the exposure of the acid inside to air would ignite. The glass bottle or glass bead was done away with a few decades later when British pharmacist John Walker was working on a paste that could be used in guns. He was mixing potassium chlorate, antimony sulfide, and gum arabic with a stick that he ended up wiping off by dragging across the ground. 
and the dried chemicals ignited and he had accidentally invented a match that could be struck anywhere to light on fire. He didn't patent his discovery, but when a colleague named Samuel Jones saw the Strike Anywhere matches, he began doing his own experiments, adding phosphorus to the mixture to create matches called lucifers, which would ignite more dangerously, sometimes throwing sparks everywhere and sometimes just exploding. Phosphorus continued to be used in the making of matches, most notably white phosphorus, which is now known to be hazardous to health. Children and babies who sucked on matches developed skeletal deformities, and believe me, it was weird to come across many instances of this being common while I was researching. But at the time, the Industrial Revolution was right around the corner, and Strike Anywhere matches became a hot commodity. Matchmaking was profitable, and it was easy enough to get cheap labor to make. Factories at the time didn't have the health, safety, or labor standards in place they do now. They were poorly ventilated, especially in England, meaning workers were exposed to phosphorus for 12 to 16 hours per day. Not just the sucking on it by children led to deformed skeletons, but even being exposed to white phosphorus for an average of five years could lead to what became known as fossy jaw, in which a person's jaw would begin to deteriorate. At the time, the amount of phosphorus used in a pack of matches was enough to poison a person to death. While it only affected 5 to 11% of workers, Fossy jaw was still considered an epidemic at the time. Many women and girls found work in matchmaking factories, which included the factory of Bryant and May in London. By the way, there is still a company called Bryant and May that still produces matches, but apparently it's unrelated. The workers were cramped together in dark factories, with many children at risk of contracting tuberculosis or getting rickets. The workers were living in run-down, disgusting housing. Many were malnourished, adding to working long hours at the match factory. When they were home, the phosphorus in the air from the factories would often leave their clothes glowing, and many had bluish breath and would have fluorescent vomit. When a well-known, outspoken woman named Annie Besant wrote an article called White Slavery in London detailing the working conditions of matchstick makers, Bryant and May owners became furious, and they forced their workers to sign a paper to say they were happy with the way they were treated. But the women refused. One woman was even fired, and this caused the rest of the women to revolt, and about 1,500 women and girls walked out, and many went to Besant to help. They formed the Match Girls Union and went door-to-door asking for donations, and Besant wrote on behalf of them in various London papers. After three weeks of the strike, Bryant and May admitted defeat. They hired the women back, ending the fines the women had to pay for being late or being sick, and allowed them to eat in a room that was separate from the white phosphorus soon after red phosphorus, which wasn't as easily ignitable and was safe to be around, was substituted for the poisonous white phosphorus in matches. The Diamond Match Company in America was the first to produce these matches and forfeited the patent rights, which meant other companies could use the same formula to keep their workers safer. As years went on, lighters began replacing matches in most homes and pockets, but matches still hold a place, with Americans striking more than $500 billion every year. Information for this episode was sourced from Museum of Everyday Life, the BBC, Smithsonian, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. This week on Trivia Tuesday in the Story Behind Discussion Group on Facebook, Matt posted that he found out some interesting trivia about Calvin Coolidge from the podcast Cutting Class, such as Coolidge had a buzzer in the Oval Office that would summon people. When he pressed it, he would hide under the desk or behind a curtain as a joke. The fun stopped when the staff took the buzzer away. He also threw a big dinner at the White House and invited all the top-ranking admirals of the army. The admirals thought they were called for a meeting, but Coolidge didn't speak the entire time. And after everyone left, he laughed at his prank. Glenn posted cinnamon is hydrophobic, which doesn't mean afraid of water, but that it repels water, which meant that the cinnamon prank from a few years ago of people trying to swallow cinnamon is incredibly dangerous since it repels saliva. Glenn also posted the warning, do not try this at home, as inhaling cinnamon can cause irreparable damage to the throat and lungs. Mark learned that cacti only grow in North American deserts. If you'd like to talk about the trivia you pick up during the week and have it read on the show, join the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook. This episode was brought to you by the Story Behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the story behind. Thanks for listening. Who lets kids suck on matches? What is that? Less than two decades later, British vision...
Less than two decades later, British physicist, fish, I can't say British physicist. Less than two decades later, British, I can't say it. Less than two decades later, British fish, <laughs> less than two de- <laughs> British physicist Sir Robert Boyle coated paper in phosphorus and a splinter of wood in sulfur. Yes, I did it. In the early 1800s, French chemists. Oh, no. (laughs) Why can't I say this one now? French chemists. 